So that day I was going to resign from my position and then I got a promotion from my boss. And, you know, <laughs> and I was Wait, like, the day you were going to resign? The day I was going to resign. I was just really um, trying to figure out how to describe myself without a title. Mm. Ooh. Uh, welcome to Pivot Me today, Alicia. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Absolutely. So we we just read your bio. You have done so many things. In there, we talked about some shifts that you've had. Um, I'd love us to tell... I'd like us to understand a little bit about your backstory, um, your corporate career, and then we'll talk about the shift from leaving corporate and what that looked like. Yeah. So um, I actually, I grew up in Kentucky and, uh, you know, started in digital media way back in the day when I like to say the internet first started. Um, I moved to California for a couple of years, um, did freelance web design. And after California, I came to Chicago and I just fell in love with the city. Um, it had energy and great people. Um, and I felt like there's a lot of great opportunity here. I figured I'd stay here for two years, go to New York, but that was 03. <laughs> Man, I'm still here. So um, I started working in digital media um, on the agency side of corporate and um, help brands with buying uh, media, then went into the publisher side. So worked for companies like E Online and Live Nation and People Magazine. Um, and my last corporate job was at WME, which is a talent agency, and they had acquired IMG. So IMG has a ton of sports, um, fashion week. So my job was vice president of global partnerships to sit kind of across all of their assets. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a lot of fun because we could basically, uh, you know, work with a brand to come up with custom solutions or custom events, um, anything really to um, create for that brand, leveraging the celebrities, the events, the assets um, for eight figure deals. Um, I was traveling a ton to LA, uh, mm -hmm. four or five days a week and was really outsourcing my entire life. Um, mm -hmm. which made me realize that I wanted to make that shift. Yeah. It was, was it the outsourcing the, um, entire life that made you realize you wanted to make that shift? I want to make sure I heard that right. Yeah. So there were, there was definitely a few different pieces. So, okay. um, I, I kind of had been wanting to, shift out, um, of corporate for a while because yeah. I started a family and, you know, I was kind of doing the dance of, I am a very ambitious lady who likes to work. Um, but the juggling of it all, you know, in the myth of balance, uh, it just, I, I wanted to be able to show up as a hundred percent at everything that I did. And mm -hmm. I was, you know, challenged with that as I was sure. becoming a new mom. Um, and before that I was, um, Actually, in 2007, um, my husband was going to propose to me and um, I, I totally knew he was going to, but it was like that very exciting week. And I had um, an event happen to where my dad actually passed away suddenly um, and unexpected. He was 57 and he was my best friend. I mean, I loved him dearly. They were in Kentucky. And I was leaving a night from um, being out with girlfriends and, and I got a call on a bus and I'll never forget. I went outside um, the bus because my phone kept, you know, ringing like crazy and it was snowing and my mom called and told me that he had passed away. And I just collapsed on the sidewalk and a homeless person came up to me and they sat down with me and they asked what was the matter. And, you know, I told them and they sat there for 20 minutes until my husband came and grabbed me. And I swear it was an angel. Like it was just such a, a pivotal moment in my life. And, um, and it was such a, a loss of something so special, you know, and I didn't know how to transition or to move forward or anything. Um, and so that was definitely a, a moment where I didn't know the massive impact it would have on my life throughout the years, but, um, that was the real underlying reason because I realized that life was really short and mm -hmm. that, you only have a certain amount of time to truly do what you want to do and um, be with the people that you want to be with. So as I was going through that path, going back to the, you know, outsourcing my life and all of this, it was like, I had climbed to the top. I had made it to this amazing position of this amazing company. It was like a dream job. I was working with movie studios and celebrities and all this stuff mm -hmm. that I had aspired to do as a young girl in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. But 
I didn't get to see my family. And I, it's like, I had a nanny and my kids had food allergies. So I had a chef that cooked special food for them. And, you know, somebody else was basically living my life. And so, wow. um, I, my default is to go into hustle culture uh, mode, you know, where you're just going and going. And so now I can catch myself and, you know, stop it before it happens. But back then it was really a awakening for me. And I had kind of made a commitment to myself when my dad had passed away that I would be present always and, um, you know, be a hundred percent. But that was the moment when I was in corporate where it was kind of a little nudge again of like, you know, what take you back to this and, sure. um, actually make the jump. Wow. That is a huge, um, I think I gotta tell you the story about the homeless person really just is yeah. so incre incredibly impactful. Um, I'm so sorry for your loss, but Thank you. What an amazing moment um, on the heels of that. Mm -hmm. Just the it kindness was. of strangers can be staggering. That's it, amazing. It really, really was. It was such a special moment. Yeah. Um, so when I think about this outsourcing your life that someone else was living it, um, when, like, was there a particular moment when you were in corporate America? I'm just thinking back of, I remember sort of the moment, there's a couple, but one in particular where I was like, this isn't working for me anymore, where I made a shift out of the company that I was in. Um, was there a moment like that for you, whether it was someone accidentally gave your child a, something they're allergic to, or it sounds like mm -hmm. you already know what that is? Yes. I mean, there were, it, there were definitely moments um, where I thought about it and then mm -hmm. Of course, you know, there was one, I actually, that day I was going to resign from my position. And then I got a promotion from my boss. And, you know, <laughs> and Wait, like, the day you were going to resign? The day I was going to resign. And that was at Live Nation. So that was at a different job. So wow. I was like, okay, this is a sign. I'm going to stay, you know, and um, we can so use that. This is a sign both ways, right? Yes, we can, we can so really true. get that wrong. <laughs> so true. And, and that was, I mean, my boss was so great there. He was phenomenal, such a great mm. guy. So I stayed for longer. And then actually when I went to the last company, I wasn't going to go there. I was trying to refer other people. And my girlfriend was like, Alicia, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Mm. You know, you can always step away. Your kids are still young. Just take it and see where it goes. And so I did for a little bit, but mm -hmm. I knew my heart wasn't there. And when I was in California and I remember I was sitting there at these meetings and my daughter, um, she was sick and had, uh, uh, we didn't know what was going on with her stomach. And later we found out she was celiac. Um, but my son has asthma and, you know, he had to go to the ER for that. And it's just like as a mother to not be there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for those moments where yes, other people can help out, but it's, it's a um, crucial moment in not being able to have any flexibility or to know that I had to mentally be at a sea level meeting and, you know, put on the whole show um, mm -hmm. while my kids were in the hospital or, or really sick. It just didn't seem like it was working for me. And so yeah. um, they were expanding the role in my position to where it would start to include some other um, things within it. So like name and title and like some of that kind of stuff that is not, um, of interest to me. And I just decided that was it. I was going to leave the industry and, mm -hmm. um, make a, make a big jump and shift. So talk to us about that jump, because when we've talked to people before who've made sort of those transition, it sounds like the thing that's the biggest struggle. And I know that was for me as well, leaving corporate America is the identity shift. Like, Oh my gosh. How was that for you? I had the biggest imposter syndrome, I swear. So I had worked 17 years, you know, mm -hmm. corporate. I, I I paid my dues, mm -hmm. but when I left, I felt like I didn't have anything. That was my identity. I mm -hmm. was always in digital media events, you know, vice president at these great companies. And I would find myself at the park with, you know, other moms yeah. and like, so I'm working on this project. And at the time I had, cause I never took time off. Um, I had a client at WME that I wasn't able to work with and um, Nicole Ritchie was doing a, a, an event. And so I helped with business development and empowerment event for her. Um, but I loved what I did. So I would always talk about it, but we'd be at the park and I'd start talking about my project, you know, or ask them what they do. And, and it was like, 
I was just talking and they didn't, they didn't really care, you know, but it was like, who am I if I don't talk about this? Because mm-hmm. that was so much of my identity. And I did not realize that. Sure. And then as I was trying to, you know, decide from, I knew I wanted to do something as an entrepreneur or, um, advisory type of role or something, but I didn't know what I wanted to do at that moment. And so when I would look at my experience in corporate, I just could not see how it translated into the entrepreneurial world for a long time. And I think that was um, a big challenge for when you transition out, you don't realize that you have so many transferable skills Mm -hmm. that easily transfer over and it's just the application of it um, and can be extremely beneficial in that type of environment. But at the time, I mean, I was just really um, trying to figure out how to describe myself without a title. Mm. Ooh, how to describe myself (laughs) without a title. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's powerful. Challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you, I mean, how did you get past that? So eventually you go on to create something. So l- l- let's talk about what you created after that. Cause you yeah. went on to, to get involved in this community. You created this community. Talk to us about what happened after that. Yep. So, um, so I'll go back a little bit just to, to provide context of why I went this direction. So when I was at WME, um, there was a woman there who ran, she was head of, uh, the literary department and of women's events. So they did Oprah's events and Ariana Huffington and a lot of really cool events. And she was also the only woman on the board of directors at WME. And so I reached out to her when I first started at the company, I wanted to meet her. So I sat down and met with her and um, it was the first time I'd seen really leadership at that level where somebody was a hundred percent present and really wanted to help you, even though they didn't know you and she cared for like the greater good of, um, the company and your career. And I mean, we sat talked for an hour and a half. Um, so we connected instantly. And then throughout my time at WME, I would side hustle for her because she would do women's events and I just love the work that she did. So it wasn't my real, you know, my full-time job, but I would help out to, um, to be involved. And so, um, I helped her put together or worked on the founding team for this um, event called Together Live and um, has like Lynn Doyle Melton and it's gone on for a few years and it was so fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I left, that was that was really impactful in my life. And so when I left, I just kept thinking back to that that leadership style of leading with love and mm-hmm. you know everything I'd gone through in my life. And I definitely wanted to um, replicate that in whatever I did. Um, and so... I started attending a bunch of different um, events just to meet some new people in Chicago and, um, you know, kind of hone in on what I wanted to do. And as I would go to, I go to these events and I would just have such a great time. The energy would just be electric and it's like people, it was contagious, right? Mm -hmm. As an entrepreneur, you surround yourself by amazing people and it is just such a wonderful thing and inspires you. And you realize there's so many people who relate to what you're going through mm-hmm. and we go to these events and then I come home and be like, okay, <laughs> sitting with my dogs, kids are at summer camp. And I just wanted to find a place that could bring that together and we could have that all the time. So mm-hmm. I decided to create it. And, um, there was a couple of co-working spaces that had popped up, um, at the time. And so I went to my husband and, um, I was like, Hey, so I want to take all of our savings and invest it into a space that helps, you know, advance women in corporate and brings us together and host events. Are you cool with that? <laughs> and of course he was, I mean, he's great. And, uh, but it was so funny because it was such a pivot mm-hmm. from what my career was. Um, but for me, there was no other option not to do it. I was, I just knew in my gut that it was what I needed to do. And I've always been a risk taker and figured, you know, what's the worst that could happen. So I was going to do it and I, I did it. So open the space up. Um, and I thought it would grow slowly. And I took some of the marketing and, um, you know, grassroots and all that stuff from, my corporate days to get people into the space. And so I brought in a lot of different women's groups. Um, I had a launch party, invited my old world, my new world, um, the press, all that. And it took off so quickly, you know, hired a few more people to help, um, grow the, 
the space, the programming, um, events, all that. One thing that I heard out of there was that you were all, you've always been a risk taker. And I wonder if that made the transition not easier, but just like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm someone who dumps the puzzle box over all the time and says, all right, we're, we're creating something totally different. Um, I wonder if that makes that tolerance for risk. I mean, not a lot of people would dump all of their savings into this idea. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. I definitely, um, over time have always believed in taking risks. And I think I've built the confidence to believe in my ability to figure things out. So it may not have been necessarily that it would have worked exactly how I planned it, but I mm -hmm. know that we have resources, we have connections. I mean, we have Google. Yeah, <laughs> and, you exactly. You know, never able to leverage your resources to really, mm -hmm. um, you know, gain the insight and knowledge that you need or um, connections and that kind of thing. So I've definitely taken risks throughout my life. I think the difference in this one was that um, at a family. And so mm -hmm. before, you know, I take these huge risks and, you know, move to LA, don't know anybody, I move to Chicago, don't know anybody, um, and start careers and things. But when you have a family, you have to think about things differently. Yeah. Um, and so it was definitely more challenging, but, um, as far as, you know, the mental side of it, but it was, it was exciting. And, um, and there wasn't really a place like it in Chicago. So there was a need. And as soon as it opened, you just saw how much people wanted to come together and connect. And, mm -hmm. um, and I had a lot of people from my past who wanted to, you know, be a part of it and, um, came and kind of bridged the gap between corporate and entrepreneurship, which is sure. um, not always combined. So it was really supporting. You know, the other thing I'm hearing is in addition to, um, being a risk taker, I'm also hearing a ton of confidence. You know, in your just unwavering ability to, I'm going to make this work out. Like it might get a little messy, but I'm going to make this work out. Have you always been that confident? You know, I I definitely ebb and flow. <laughs> <laughs> My days. <laughs> um, I think the the thing that kind of I got a kick one time from one of my. Um, bosses. And I used to, I call myself the recovering perfectionist because for me, everything had to be perfect before I put it out there. Mm. And so I, I'm very, um, it, it, it's like, I wanted it to be a masterpiece. Like I'm very mm. intentional about what I create and what I put out there. So I want to make sure that it's going to add value and be Perfect. relevant to the people I'm, you know, um, targeting or working with. But I would spend so much time on creating things and just iterating on it and, you know, doing design or these different things. And one of my bosses one time was like, Alicia, your 80% is like 120 for a lot of people. You just need to get it out there and continue mm -hmm. to evolve it as you go. Yeah. And, um, and it was a good kick for me because it gave me the confidence to just believe in the 80% version and sure. not get so stuck up on things. And, um, and I think with the transition from corporate to entrepreneurship, I was definitely not confident along the journey as I was, you know, pivoting and trying to figure out that identity piece. But mm -hmm. once I um, found what I loved and was so passionate about, I mean, it was, it was just such a great space and it was, yeah. I don't know, I felt like it was where I belonged and what I was meant to do. And um, so it definitely supported on the confidence side. I bet. I bet. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about on Pivot Me is also um, sabotage, like how we self-sabotage. We talk about how people self-sabotage, but then it's really good for us to hear, hey, here's this person who's had this great success in the corporate arena, then pivoted to the entrepreneur space, had success there as well. Um, but we all self-sabotage. Would you be willing to share with us how you self-sabotage and what you do oh to get God. yourself out of it? Yes, I am known as a saboteur, <laughs> <laughs> personally, professionally. Um, yeah, I, I, oh my gosh, I, I, I'm just laughing because my husband always jokes about this too. When we first started dating, not to digress, but when we first started dating and things were going well, I'm like, I'm new to city. I just moved to Chicago. I don't want to date anybody. And he's like, it's okay. We don't need a serious relationship. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I just kept trying to sabotage it because it was so great. Um, and so it's so funny. And that's, you know, a long time ago now, 2003. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the business side, I, I found myself doing the same thing where as I was growing a team and, you know, I had management experience on the corporate side, but when you're building out all the infrastructure and you're, you know, 
flying the plane as you're mm -hmm. building it. Um, it's a different story. And so I would find myself wanting to, you know, um, not meet time frames or, mm -hmm. um, you know, shying away from things because I just didn't think that, um, I didn't think we were there mm -hmm. and we were there going back to 80% every time it's like, just launch the, you know, expansion. We got a second sure. space, just do it. But, um, I definitely pushed a, a lot of launches in the beginning, um, mm -hmm. of products that we were going to roll out because I didn't feel like we were ready when we were definitely ready. And, um, and I should have channeled the confidence a little bit more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How do you move past that? Is it that someone, maybe someone else comes in and says mm -hmm. like your boss did that one time, your 80% is everyone else's 120%. Yes. Like, how do you get out of the failure to launch because you feel like something needs to be cleaned up more? So going back to the community piece, I found that, um, the community has been such an impactful piece of my journey. And, mm -hmm. um, a lot of people will give me the kick that I need or the nudge mm -hmm. or remind me, um, that, you know, we get so busy in life and so distracted by so many things. And, um, sometimes you forget all the things mm -hmm. that you've done or that, um, you know, what you, uh, how you need to approach things. And mm -hmm. so that community was good at holding me accountable for, um, truly, following my passion and, and, um, creating what I wanted to build. Yeah. Uh, so I've had a lot of good people that will come and give me the little nudge, uh, to move past it and then hold on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, so on pivot me, we talk about the, the add a boy or the add a girl folder, which is like this sort of collection of amazing things we've done in the past. Yes. And it's sort of this treasure trove of accomplishments. And it's not necessarily the tro trophy moment. It can be, but it can also be like, I overcame this. You know, mm -hmm. one of the gals is like, I did a home birth and I was in labor for 36 hours. That ended up going in her add a girl folder. Shout out to Rachel. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's that someone else I'm thinking about their, their brother had passed away and they were very close. And, mm. and he said, actually, I, I use that as evidence of my ability to, to persevere against all odds. So it can be all sorts of things, but did you go back to sort of, wait, this is who Alicia is. Like she's mm -hmm. overcome in so many situations and she's run this, this big team. And she was the VP of a prominent company. She's done all of these things. So that means she can probably do this other thing. Yeah, that was, that's a big piece for me because I didn't really understand, um, the depth behind resiliency mm -hmm. and, you know, even the journey of grieving or any of those pieces and how they factor into your decisions in your life moving forward. And so, um, I have to say the thing with my father was the most difficult thing I've ever been through. Um, and it, because I went through that and it wasn't, a, you know, overnight, process that, you know, you feel better or, you know, how to, um, adjust kind of your routines and that kind of thing mm -hmm. that, that some of the skill sets that I've learned in there, or just, you know, seeing that I was able to continue to move forward. And so when I was faced with challenges of, you know, my children having these anaphylactic reactions at three months old mm -hmm. or, um, at a business, you know, situation, or if I've closed the space and making those decisions, like, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, I've gotten through and have overcome so much. And so just channeling that. And I think I am a big, big fan of, I love what you call it, the Atta, Attaboy, Attaboy folder. Um, mm -hmm. We talk about a lot with imposter syndrome and mm -hmm. with imposter syndrome, it's so important to just make sure that you document all of your successes and that you're celebrating these little wins along the way, because yes. Especially if you are the person um, like me who is just going, going, going. If you don't stop and look back or look at where you are, then you don't realize how much you've accomplished and you just see that to do list in front of you that never goes away mm -hmm. and it can become consuming. So um, that's a huge thing for me is, is definitely, um, you know, being able to reference that. All right. So we have our final question before I ask that final question, where is the best place for people to connect with you? Yes. So you can go to evolveher.community um, or you can go to Instagram uh, and it's Alicia underscore Driscoll or um, Evolver. Perfect. And we're going to put that those links in the show notes as well. So for our final question, if you could tell the world one thing, what would it be? Oh, I would definitely say 
um, that your story is never over and that just remember to continue to evolve and to give yourself the grace and the time to truly prioritize yourself so that you can always live the life that you want. And while it sounds easier said than done, mm -hmm. um, if you are able to continue to check in with yourself and really understand where your values, what mm -hmm. they are and how you're aligned with them um, and the priorities based on where you are, mm -hmm. then you can see if you're, you know, where you need to be at that moment or if you need to evolve. And mm -hmm. I feel like evolving gets a bad rep. So you just got to embrace it and go from there. Absolutely. If you're looking for even more ways to level up your business and your life, we have set up the next video for you. I'll see you over there.